Well, Ken, it's very kind of you, uh, but when you say that, I have to uh, acknowledge that everything I learned, I learned at the feet of the master. So, uh, be that as it may, uh, I've got the unenviable position of standing between you and the break. So let's see uh, how quick we can do this. Okay, so I'm gonna tell you about PCI in a few minutes. Just suffice it to say, uh, the frequency of PCI in the world, or at least in the US, is going down, and that's probably because of more data, and probably because the things Dr. Namby talked to you about at the very beginning of this session really do work. So this is not exactly a growth area, although that may change. The mechanism of PCI, this is why acceptance was slow. This is why surgeons, uh, very rightly, were slow to accept it. We thought we were compressing soft plaque. The surgeons said that's impossible. And in fact, when, after PCI was started and autopsy specimens became available, you know, people who died of non-cardiac uh, causes, <laughs> we learned we were really wrong. So take a look at this picture, and very simply, if you don't know this, when you inflate a balloon in a coronary artery, you're not compressing anything. You're generally not stretching the vessel very much. What you're doing is inducing a series of therapeutic tears in the vessel, uh, shown in the two, uh, two right-hand portions of this slide. Uh, and this is uh, responsible for both the success of PCI, because if you go back to Al's angiography lecture, as you look at this from multiple angles, you can see how your total luminal cross-sectional area, in most cases, is going is to be somewhat larger. And in fact, patients felt better in terms of angina after this was done. It's also responsible for the weaknesses, because now you've torn the atherosclerotic plaque, and now you've got lots of media exposed to the flow of blood, and what does that cause? Clots. Yeah, so as angioplasty started, thrombosis was a major issue. Much of that's changed in the world of stenting, starting in the early 1990s in the US. If you think about what you do when you inflate a stent, you take those uh, pictures that I just showed you, you compress those flaps against the wall of the blood vessel, and now you have nature's number one anti-thrombotic mechanism working in your favor. And what's that? That's flow. You now have good blood flow that washes platelets and clots that are starting to form off the surface of that vessel. But that wasn't perfect. Multiple stent designs, some better than others. There was pretty good evolution in terms of radial strength, strut thickness, et cetera. But uh, this was still a powerful stimulus for re-narrowing to occur inside the vessels, continued pressure on the vessel. So what were developed? Drug-eluting stents. And what does a drug-eluting stent consist of? Stent, the metal frame, plus the drug, plus a way to control the release of the drug, and that's the polymer. So the drug prevents cell replication by interfering with the cell cycle and cell re cellular reproduction. Uh, reducing instant renarrowing almost from the get, actually absolutely from the get-go. And in, first the, in fact, the first randomized trial had a restenosis rate of 0%. Relatively small study, but a very clear, and some you know, physicists call zero a singularity for a reason. It gets your attention, and it got the world's attention. Uh, and in fact, in virtually every study, the uh, rate of instant restenosis is now Re reduced from 20% to less than 5%. So restenosis, you know, people like to talk about, but it's largely, from a clinical point of view, a historical artifact. We see some, it's still a problem, but much, much less than uh, we thought. To make a long story short, in 2006, there was a big scare about the risk of acute thrombosis following drug-eluting stents that largely has been allayed. Uh, the use of DES dropped from about 90% to somewhere between 60 and 70% in the following year. In most of the world, it's back up to 70, uh, more than, actually, more than 80%. So drug-eluting stents, we use them in PCI all the time. We think of them in terms of generations. First-generation stents, Sirolimus or Paclitaxel eluting, had relatively thick struts, were made of 316L stainless steel, and had... Uh, 
polymers that are described as durable, formally. Informally, they're designed as, they're defined as noxious. They are cell irritant. In some cases, they produce immune responses. Vessel, blood vessels don't like that. Next generation were everolimus or zoterolimus eluting stents. These are the uh, anti-proliferative drugs that are on all stents now. The struts became considerably thinner, so you take up less real estate in the vessel. Newer alloys that are more flexible, actually a little more visible radiographically, and less noxious, thinner polymers. Easier delivery, less restenosis, and possibly shorter duration of DAPT therapy. And then third generation stents. Notice there's no second generation because these stents didn't all come out in boluses. Third generation stents are bioabsorbable, have either bioabsorbable polymers, so at the end of the day, after the restenosis risk has abated, you are left with a bare metal stent or entirely bioabsorbable scaffolds. This is where most of the buzz is now. Now, these things have been around for two decades and really haven't caught you know, caught the wind in Europe, but they've been available. Um, theoretically, they're made of bioabsorbable uh, materials such as uh, polylactate or magnesium, different designs of stents. In theory, you'd love it. You've got a scaffold effect, releases drug, changes occur within the plaque and within the vessel, and after a period of months to years, the, the stent entirely disappears, and theoretically, one is left with a large and a possibly less diseased vessel. Well, that hasn't really worked out so well, probably because these stents haven't been well designed. In fact, as a result of marketing, they're no longer called stents, they're called scaffolds now. Um, it hasn't worked out so well. Because of their design, they're a little more difficult to deliver. You've got to be more precise about the sizing of the stent relative to the vessel. You've got to spend more time preparing the vessel. The stents are bulkier and thicker. And in at least two registries, the biggest one is the GHOST EU registry, the rate of acute stent thrombosis is 2% at a year. That's uh, the dreaded complication, twice as common as with current generation metal, metal stents. So keep that in mind. Thus far, it hasn't worked out as well as it had been hoped, and the use actually has dropped off in Europe where it's available. Now, what do we know about acute stent thrombosis? That's been an issue. It's still an issue. 1% to the end of a year. Most of those, probably 2% in patients with acute MIs. Most of those events shown here by the blue uh, bars occur up front. After the first month, there is still a relatively steady rate that so far out to seven years is fairly constant of stent thrombosis. And this is the presumed pathology. This is an autopsy specimen. You can see the stent is fairly well expanded. If you look in the panels at, on the right, you'll see some areas where there are little holes in the tissue around the uh, lumen of the vessel. Those are stent struts. And not all the stent struts have been covered. So just as the stent and drug inhibit uh, smooth muscle cell growth from the media, they also inhibit recovery of the endothelium. And that has led to two things. So first of all, this risk of stent thrombosis, and in an attempt to allay that, we use dual antiplatelet therapy. And the, the, this is the uh, DAPT study I talked about this morning, more than 10,000 patients showing that 12 months had of DAPT therapy uh, prevented more stent thrombosis than 12 months, and that there was a drop off, uh, I mean, a, a recurrence of stent thrombosis, a catch up, even after 30 months when DAPT was stopped. So that's number one. And this is number two. This is, uh, Burglar alluded to this this morning, this is an observation that Al and his research staff made uh, about in, in the late 90s, published in the year 2000. Patients who underwent non-cardiac surgery after bare metal stent placement within the first month had 
a very high rate of clinical events. You know, unfortunately, my presentation got a little massacred here. That says seven MIs and eight deaths out of 40 patients. Not such a good thing. And if you think about drug eluding stents now with much slower endothelial recovery, these rates early on are probably higher. And we don't know exactly when that risk abates. But the point is, if someone has had a recent PCI, if they have elective surgery planned, the longer you can wait, the better. Now, I talked about DAP duration. There is still a fair amount of controversy. As I've shown you, there are many randomized trials of varying quality that show varying results. Generally, it's accepted that three months of DAPT is a minimum. The DAPT trial is the largest and most rigorous. That suggests that in patients who tolerate DAPT, longer the better. Okay, that's part one. Part two, PCI. We got lots of toys. We are all boys with toys. We like these things. They're all fun to use. And I'm not going to tell you about any of these. If you're in your first year fellowship, by the time you're an interventional fellow, you'll, there'll be more of these, and some of these may disappear. We can do lots of things. And think about this. this the most dominant part of your cortex is the visual cortex. Things you see will far override reasoning that you do. We like to make pictures better. We love it. That's fulfilling. That's quickly gratifying. That's a large part of what we do. So we can do things like this, make pretty ugly looking blood vessels look pretty nice. This slide really got massacred. This was a chronic occlusion of the right, looked pretty bad. This guy who was really symptomatic. This is probably the, the, the only CTO I've ever seen that really needed to be done. But it was done successfully. Wire crossed over from the left into the right, snared it, did all the right things, had a very nice result. Patient felt a lot better, a lot better than what happened to this picture. So the picture's massacred, the patient's fine. But you have to make decisions. You've got to be able to predict what the wallet says. And, and that's the other half of this talk. You have to have realistic expectations about the procedures that you either recommend or that you do. So what are reasonable expectations for PCI and STEMI? If it's performed within the first 12, maybe 24 hours, it saves lives. Non-ST elevation ACS prevents MIs and probably saves lives. Stable ischemia, well, it doesn't prevent MI. We've seen that in the COURAGE trial. It doesn't save lives. And if you look hard at COURAGE, there's a modest reduction of angina at three years that's not present at six years. So, you know, keep your expectations checked. We don't like COURAGE. We don't. Like all clinical trials, it's imperfect. Well, imagine that. Not only is it imperfect, it didn't show what we wanted it to show. Well, that's strike two. But, you know, we've all come to accept it. You've you got to know about this stuff. You've got to put it in its place. What if they have ischemia? I mean, that's all I hear from our fellows all goddamn day long. It's ridiculous. What if they have ischemia? Well, then they need something done. Well, I don't know. A hundred million dollars of my tax money right now has been designated by the NIH to be spent determining if there's a clinical benefit to revascularizing patients with ischemia. We don't know that. Take a look. This is, uh, these are patients from uh, Courage who had inducible ischemia. You could make ischemia look better. You could make ischemia disappeared. It had no effect on the risk of MI or the risk of death. So 100 million bucks are now being spent to answer that. Think about it. There are also lots of models around to predict risk of PCI. This is the Mayo Clinic mortality risk. This is the syntax score. Mahesh told you about this. It's really easy. Once you get used to doing it, you add up all the characteristics of all the revascularizable lesions. You get on the website. You spend a few minutes, and it will tell you what the syntax score is. You then 
think back to the syntax trial. This is the, these are the tertiles of the syntax score that Mahesh told you about. Low tertile, so not too much disease, not horrendous disease anatomic characteristics. Bypass and PCI looked about the same at three years. As you went to the higher two tertiles, PCI looked worse than bypass. Of course, most of those recurrent events were revascularizations, not catastrophic events. These are things you keep in mind. Here's something else you've got to keep in mind. This is the Freedom Trial. Mahesh also referred to this this morning. Multivessel disease in patients with diabetes. Bypass versus PCI. Bypass did a lot better. And then finally, we've got AUC. I mean, you know, for all my life, it meant area of the, under the curve. Now it means appropriateness of use criteria. 60 different criteria, appropriateness uh, divided uh, into appro usually appropriate, rarely, ap usually appropriate, uncertain appropriateness, rarely appropriateness. You're not supposed to be perfect here. You're supposed to have about a 10% rarely appropriate rate. So what do you do with someone like this? Who owns a motorcycle? Who owns a sports car? Okay, let me ask you this. Who doesn't own a Volvo? Raise your hand if you're... Okay, so you guys have consciously accepted a little bit of an increased risk for one reason or another, right? <laughs> okay, so now you got this patient on the side. What does this patient have? This patient has a high-grade left main, six weeks of progressive angina. What should you do with this patient? Uh, raise your hand if you think stent. Raise your hand if you think bypass. Okay. Well, uh, let me offer you a third alternative, especially to you non-Volvo owners. How about you do what the patient wants? So this is what you got to do. You got to say, okay, patient, here's what you got. You got an isolated, high-grade left, <laughs> left main lesion. If it were me, I'd have a bypass. I'd say, guys, I got a good target. I'm a big, strong guy. I got a big lima. Drop a lima into my LAD. You know, that's what I said to the patient. I said, we don't usually put stents in these. We think we can do it safely, but our long-term follow-up isn't so good. I don't know how long your stent's going to last. I don't know. It won't shut down on you and kill you. What do you want to do? Well, the patient said, you know, I really do not want to be operated. I have a bad feeling about surgery. I think I'm not going to be one of the lucky ones. <laughs> well, look, you know, it, you, you've got to respect that. I mean, you know, putting the stent in was technically pretty easy. Am I concerned about the long term in this patient? Yes, <laughs> more than the patient is. But, you know, society lets us make choices. And I think as you take these data, and you know, you're going to have patients with multivessel disease and diabetic and diabetes, who are rational people who just don't want surgery. You know, the things that drive people to make decisions for themselves are culturally and psychologically complex. I think what you do is you use these things as guideposts. So thank you. <laughs>